All right, welcome to Unit 1, Exploring One Variable Data for AP Statistics. We're going to dive right into Topic 1.9 on comparing distributions of a quantitative variable. So here, any of the graphical representations of data can be used to compare two or more independent samples. So if you have two independent samples, now what do we mean by independent samples? It means that like Davy cannot be in both samples, right? If you're going to look at heights of boys from one school versus heights of boys for another school, you can't have Davy be going to both schools and being somehow involved in both groups. Then all of a sudden what's happening in one group is affecting the next group and so forth. So we want independent, you know, we want independent samples for the most part. That's really good samples. It means that we have two separate samples and they're from two different groups. Like I said, this high school versus that high school or something like that, that allow us to really do a nice job of comparing them. But whether we do histograms, side-by-side -side box plots, which you could also call parallel box plots, just box plots on top of each other, back-to-back um, -back stem plots, side-by-side -side dot plots, you know, any of these graphical representations can be used to compare two groups of data. Um, and again, everything we've learned, we're still going to be applying, right? You still got to talk about center. You still got to talk about shape. You still got to talk about variability and outliers if you have any. So we don't compare with scatter plots. This is kind of like a little disclaimer here, okay? We haven't learned quite yet what scatter plots are, but you may already have an idea of what they are, say from science class or just common knowledge. But I want to be crystal clear here. We never use scatter plots to compare one variable between two groups, right? Scatter plots are used for one set of individuals of whom two variables are measured. We're going to get deep into that in the next unit. But right now, don't ever misinterpret and think that scatter plots can somehow be used to compare two different groups. Scatter plots actually represent a single group that just gets measured twice for two different variables. So, you know, this is oftentimes a multiple choice question on the AP test. You know, which of the following can be used to compare two sets of data? Histograms, box plots, stem plots, dot plots, or scatter plots? And scatter plots is a no. You don't want to use scatter plots. All right, so let's make sure that we understand what happens when we compare data sets, right? We could also use all the numerical summaries that we have learned to compare two or more independent samples, right? So we could say, oh, that group has a mean of blah, blah, blah. And well, that group has a higher mean of this. Same thing with median, IQR, standard deviation, relative frequencies. All of these things can be used when we talk about and compare data. Just keep in mind that we need to compare, right? I get so many times where kids will just inform. They'll say, they'll list me a ton of characteristics about A, data set A, and they'll list a ton of characteristics about data set B, and then they stop right there. Well, that's not comparing, right? We want to see like greater than, less than. This is the same as this. This is different than this. You want to make sure you're definitely comparing in context. So what I have set up here for us are actually three examples, and I'm just going to kind of read the examples, show it to you, and then you could pause the video, think of what you would say, and then look at my answer afterwards. All right, so here's the first example, visualizing. A new basketball coach wants to see if he could help his players make more shots by teaching them to visualize the ball going into the hoop prior to shooting it. So the coach wants to see if visualizing actually works, so he conducts an experiment with 20 basketball players of similar abilities. He randomly placed 10 of them to group 1, that would get visualizing training, and 10 into group 2, who would receive no visualizing training. After the training, all players were asked to shoot a basketball from 22 feet from the hoop, each player was instructed to continue to shoot until two consecutive shots were made. The players who received the visualization training were instructed to utilize their training before each shot. And what they recorded was the total number of attempts, including the final two made, that were recorded for each player. And the results for each group are in the following parallel box plots. So just in summary, we had one group who before every shot, they were trained to visualize. Another group, they just started shooting basketball hoops. Each player, we let them shoot until they made two consecutive shots, and we counted how many total shots it took for them to do so. All right, here is the box plots. This is called a parallel box plot. They're parallel to each other, on top of each other. The top one is for the visualization group, and the bottom one is for the no visualization group. And we see our scale here for the total number of attempts. So the first question wants us to compare the two distributions of data and comment on if you believe the visualization training helped the players make consecutive shots sooner than those that did not. And B, for these two sets of data, what summer statistics would best describe or would be best used to discuss the center in spread? All right, so 
Real quick, keep in mind that these are how many attempts it took until they made their two shots. Um, so lower would be better, right? If it only took me three shots, it means that I missed the first and then made and made the next two in a row, right? So keep that in mind. So if you want to go ahead and pause right now, the next slide I'm going to show is actually the answer. So you might want to pause, think about what you would say, maybe jot down some things, then see how it compares. All right, so here's what I wrote. I wrote the visualization group had a much lower center at four attempts, while the group that did not visualize had a higher median at seven attempts. So I compared the medians. Pretty clear to see that the median for the visualization group was lower than the median for the no visualization group. I then continued to say the visualization group did not have an outlier. Oh, I'm sorry, did have an outlier that took 19 attempts. But what that outlier said, the variability of the visualization group was much smaller than the group that did not. So if you just look at the visualization group, they didn't vary as much. Their scores had a smaller um, range and a smaller IQR. And then I noted that. I said the visualization group had an IQR of six attempts, while the non-visualization group had an IQR of 10 attempts. And how do you calculate IQR? All you're doing is the third quartile minus the first quartile. All right, you can also see from the box plots that 75% of the non-visualization groups had more attempts than the median of the visualization groups. So if you go back up here, what you can actually see here is here's Q1 for the non-visualization group, right? 75% of kids were above that, where that same value, which marked the, you know, first quartile, the 25th percentile, 25% above, 75% below, that same value happened to be the median for this visualization group. So you could kind of compare there and say, you know, like, you know, half of the group, half of the visualization group was lower than 75% of the non-visualization group. So that tells you a lot. I also mentioned that I thought both looked somewhat skewed to the right. You can see that both of them are a little bit elongated to the right-hand side. So it's a sign of skewed right, especially with an outlier that's definitely going to skew you to the right as well. Whoops, sorry about that. All right, so then I wrote, I would conclude that for these groups, it does appear that visualization training seemed to work. That group did overall have less attempts to make the two consecutive shots. Although this was just an experiment with many other factors, so I can't say visualization will work, but it does seem there's some tendencies there. Now, what would I use to describe the shape, I'm sorry, the center and the spread? Well, for both groups, I concluded that they were somewhat skewed to the right. And when you're skewed to the right, I hope you listened, that you would rather use the median and the IQR to represent the data. Furthermore, based on what I'm seeing here, I have, there's no way I could calculate the mean and standard deviation anyway. But it's the skewness to the right that actually makes the median and the IQR the much, measure, the much better measures of center and spread. All right, next example deals with razor blades to shave. So a consumer group compared the longevity of two types of razor blades, an inexpensive generic blade and a more expensive name brand blade. Two independent samples were randomly selected. One consisted of 10 generic blades and the other consisted of 10 name, name brand blades. The number of shades obtained before a blade became too dull to provide a close shave was recorded for each blade in the two independent samples. Results are shown in the following stem plots. So here I'm actually going to give you all the data. Here is how many shaves it took, how many shaves it lasted before it came too dull for generic and name brand. And then I also made a stem plot for both the generic and the name brand. So what we want to do is compare the two distributions of data and comment on if there's a difference in type of razor in terms of which gives more clean shaves. So you could probably see some quick things popping up right away just by looking at this. So if you want to go ahead and pause it, think about it, and then I'm going to go ahead and show my answer. All right, here's what I wrote. I wrote the name brand clearly has a higher center around 110 close shaves, while the generic brand has a center around 105 close shaves. The name brand is less spread out with all sh values above 103, while the generic razor ranges from 80 to 136. It is interesting, though, that the top two razors in the entire group were both generic. The generic just also happens to have quite a few razors that were really low. The generic seems fairly symmetric, maybe a tad skewed to the right, and the same actually can be said for name brand. I don't think this data is enough to convince me that the name brand is better. They do seem to be a little bit higher overall, while the generic just seems to be less consistent. So like I said, you know, quick look at this. It does seem like the name brand is a little bit higher, but if you look at the actual high values, the 129, the 136, even the 118, those are some of the higher values in all of the data put together. But the problem is that the generic also have these lower values, 80, 96, 97, 99, whereas the name brand did that. So I think it's kind of inconclusive, to be honest, even though at first glance it does seem the name brand is seem to be higher overall. 
So it's a nice way to just talk. But what I want you to understand is in both the last two examples, I talked about center. I talked about spread. I talked about shape. I compared them. That's what I'm asking you guys to do. All right, let's look at one more example. This is a very typical type of thing that the AP test does is they give you two sets of data, they give you a bunch of information on it, and then they want you to just have an understanding and to be able to answer some questions about this data. So let's do that real quick here. All right, so two sets of data, what can I say about them? Well, you know, a couple of things, right? So if I'm looking at data set, you know, let's talk about shape first, right? Let's talk about how we can interpret shape. Even though I don't see a graph, I can really think about shape here. All right, for example, in data set one, the median is much smaller than the mean. Whereas in data set two, they're pretty close to the same. So data set two is probably going to be fairly symmetric. Whereas in data set one, having the mean be higher than the median means I'm probably going to be skewed to the right. And these are all things I taught you to understand, even though I don't have a picture. Other signs that I'm skewed to the right is the fact that there's only a value of a difference of two between the min and Q1. Whereas if you look at the other end from Q3 to the max, there's a much wider spread. So it means the right hand side is much more spread out, another sign of skewed right. Whereas in data set two, there seems to be a nice balance between the min and Q1. And then again, Q3 and the max. It's not necessarily perfect. Actually, it is perfect. It's seven on both sides. It's pretty nice and balanced. Same thing with the median, right? Q1 to the median is about five. Q3 to the median is about seven. That's fairly balanced. It's roughly symmetric. Whereas if you look at data set one, you know, Q1 to the median is five, whereas Q3 to the median is um, um, 12. So it's a big difference there. And that's going to be a sign of skewed to the right. That right-hand side is more skewed, right? So um, I kind of already talked about center, but you can already get a feel for center here, right? We already talked about median center deviation. Um, because data set one is skewed, I would definitely go with the median and the IQR if I'm going to talk about it. Because data set two is symmetric, I would go with the mean and the standard deviation to talk about it. Those are all points that I hope that you've you know, paid attention and learned thus far in our training. Now, what else can I do? You know, I could say, hey, let's let's talk about outliers. Are there any outliers? Well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to go and check my formulas. So let's deal with data um, set one first. All right, so in data set one to check for outliers, i got to find those fences. So the upper fence is going to be Q3, 29, plus 1.5 times the IQR. So you are going to have to calculate the IQR real quick, and that would be 29, Q3, minus 12, Q1. That's the IQR of 17. Then I'm going to find the lower fence in the exact same thing, right? Uh, that's going to be Q1, 12, minus 1.5 times that IQR of 17. All right, so if you go ahead and actually calculate this, uh, you get an upper fence of 54.6, or sorry, 54.5. And let's quickly do the lower fence as well before we talk about it. 12 minus 1.5 times 17, and that is negative 13.5. All right, so based on the fact that the min is 10, I clearly do not have any values below negative 13.5. I mean, the min is 10, so there's nothing going to be the negative, right? So there's no lower outliers. But there definitely is at least one upper outlier. 56 is bigger than my upper fence, so I definitely have an outlier at 56. But could there be more outliers? Yeah. Remember, I don't have all the data in front of me. So how do I know that there is not a data value of 55? right? 55 could easily be one of my data values, making it an outlier, but still not the max. So be very careful. Don't say that there's only one outlier. Could be more, but I definitely know 56 is. Could even be more. All right, let's check out data set two here. Uh, I'll use some different colors here. So I got the lower fence and the upper fence. For data set two, the upper fence is going to be 27 plus 1.5 times the IQR. Now the IQR is actually something that these two groups have in common. They, um, I'm sorry. No, they don't. Never mind. <laughs> sorry about that. 27 minus 15 is 12. So the IQ there is 12. All right. So I have 27 plus 1.5 times 12. That is going to be 45. So right away, that tells me that I do not have any upper outliers. 34 is not bigger than 45. So there's no way I have any outliers. And then the lower fence is going to be Q115 minus 1.5 times the IQR of 12. And yeah, that's going to be 15. Uh, minus 1.5 times 
12th, and I get negative 3. Once again, with a min of 8, clearly there's nothing below negative 3, so there's no outliers. So there's a difference in these two data sets right there, just showing that data set 1 does have an outlier, which is another reason why it's kind of moving skewed right. Um, so those are all kinds of questions that you could ask. Obviously, you could compare the medians, you could compare the quartiles. I mean, it's pretty straightforward when you have all this in front of you about like what you can actually do with it. But it's pretty cool to also note that like I don't have the actual data in front of me, but I could still answer questions about shape. I could still talk about their spreads. Clearly, the standard deviation is bigger on data set one. So data set one is clearly going to be more spread out, where data set two is a much smaller standard deviation. So it's going to be much more concise and kind of clustered in towards the mean. Um, so just being able to look at data like this and look at summary statistics and learn from it, compare, is um, a pretty valuable tool that you need to be able to learn. All right, guys, that's it for this video. It's pretty straightforward. We've been doing a lot of this already. It's just about really building on these skills and making sure you don't forget anything. All right, see you in the next video.